Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome back to Watchbox, and we are waking up with watches. Everything you see on this show is in stock and ready for sale. Reach out to Tmaso at thewatchbox.com with all your purchase and pricing questions. Buy, sell, or trade, we're interested in all three. And if you want to sell a watch or trade a watch, we are always looking to build inventory. One watch or an entire collection, we pay cash, no upper limit on value paid. Reach out once again to me at Tmaso at thewatchbox.com. Let's jump straight in with a few spectacular things. Things. Starting with one, well, one, two, and three from FP Journe. It's kind of a lot. Let's start with the basics. The Chronomet Souverain Black Label. Now, this watch representing perhaps the most elemental of the Black Label watches. Black Label, by the way, only available from FP Journe Boutiques and Despas, and then only to prior purchasers of new FP Journe watches. They get the reserved Black Dial Platinum Case combination. No other Journe series will get Black Dial and Platinum Case but the Black Label. Now, the watch is 40 millimeters in diameter, quite simple, with the dial side power reserve, small seconds, and then those biomorphic tapered white gold Journe hands. Uh, you will note that the timepiece features a lovely, thin, and beautifully detailed case. Uh, the definition of the mid case is created by the overlapping lip of the case back and the bezel itself, and then you have that double dimple knurled style FP Journe crown. Flip it over, rose gold movement, this is caliber 1304, which means 13 French lean in diameter, and then work started on this movement in 2004 and it launched in 2005. Now it's 18 karat rose gold bridges and plates, so with a platinum watch and a rose gold movement, it feels quite hefty for its size. It exudes quality. Now you can see it is a fascinating movement architecture, not just finely finished, which it is, but thoughtfully laid out. You have the twin barrels to provide an even torque release from max wind to minimal wind. And then there's actually a hidden drivetrain with the train underneath the dial. And that's why there's a big open gulf between the barrels and the escapement, which seem completely isolated from each other. Throw it on the wrist. My wrist is 16 centimeters in circumference. Get a good sense of the watch's size. The watch is thin. It's under nine millimeters. You can also see it's not excessively broad across the wrist as with all 40 millimeter FP Journe watches, it's 48 millimeters from lug to lug, making it viable even on smaller wrists. So I'd say 13 and a half centimeters circumference, you can wear a 40 millimeter Journe. And you're gonna want that flexibility because I have quite a few of them available today. Now, a lot of folks prefer the symmetrical dials on the Resonance series. I guess I'm the weird guy because I like the Resonance 3, which this is. After 2009, the original 1212 dial went away and we got this uh, more travel adept 24 hour scrolling display. I like to think of it as a winking watch and that it certainly is. As you can see the minute scroll within the outer ring which is in a 24 hour format. So the watch is a true dual time but now it gives you the ability to distinguish between for example 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. Now, it's also worth mentioning that the watch, of course, is a resonance chronometer, and it is a black label. So this one, also 40 millimeters, also part of the ultra-exclusive black label. Uh, it features the resonance phenomenon. So F.P. Journe took a principle that was well-known in the worlds of pendulum clocks and metronomes that will eventually synchronize to each other if placed in proximity, and the parasitic emanations of friction and vibration that sort of radiate out from the escapements and the balances in the proper proximity, they will synchronize to each other. So if one slows down or speeds up, the other will auto-correct it. Twin movements in one case, again, rose gold. Uh, the movements are not actually coupled by any mechanical means. So you have a barrel, a train, an escapement, and a balance, and you have two separate ones. There's a little rack and a pinion at the center with a gold pinion screw that can be used to adjust the distance between them to tune the resonance phenomenon. It takes about seven to ten minutes to take purchase, which is why you will eventually see these seconds hands out of sync, even though the balance are in sync, so you use the flyback trigger down at four o'clock to synchronize those hands. Now, if you prefer something with a little bit more symmetry about it, this was a one year limited edition for one year. FP Journe reverted to a symmetrical dial, but you can see it has 1224. And I'm going to get a little bit closer. It has 1224 formats. So though it has the symmetrical layout of the original watch, uh, this watch, which can be called effectively the fourth resonance or the resonance four, is a very special timepiece that from arm's length is perfectly symmetrical, but up close still gives you that 24-hour functionality. Launched in 2019 for just one year, you can see that it also features a special flourish of blue printing. This is something Jorn generally only does on special watches. Still 40 millimeters, still platinum, still black label. It's a hand 
handsome watch that on the reverse side is almost exactly like the model you just saw. Mechanically speaking, there's not a big change here. So aesthetically, both are outstanding, handsome, functional, and absolutely handy, as even if resonance is a bit esoteric, the utility of a dual-time watch on the wrist is undoubted. Now let's throw up something that unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, unfortunately for me, but fortunately for you, uh, this 2001 model year, 36 millimeter rose gold, 150 piece limited edition Patek Philippe 5150R. I just can't lay hands on it. It's factory sealed from its last service. This was a model launched to celebrate 150 years of Tiffany and Patek Philippe as commercial partners. Now, the watch was made in three series rose, yellow, and white gold. 150 pieces of each, of which it seems the rose gold is the market favorite. Now, it has a slightly off white ecru dial with an unusual Tiffany co signed aperture style annual calendar display, and it is an annual calendar. You'll also note the index at 12 has been replaced by a rose gold 18 karat Tiffany T. So this is almost a double Tiffany signed dial. The layout of the calendar is a little bit unusual, but it's also extremely easy to read because of the apertures. You can see the 36 millimeter case in rose gold is an officer style case. And that means, of course, it does feature an officer style case with a hinged case back. And inside is caliber, a 315 automatic winding annual calendar complication with a 45 hour power reserve. Again, you will lay hands on. I only get to lay eyes on, and I am quite jealous for that. Now let's take a look at something completely different. Let's talk about Omega Seamasters because this is where my luxury watch career started. Let's start with one that came out just about a year after I first received my first Omega Seamaster. That was a graduation gift. This was a tribute to Jacques Mayol. It is a tribute to the legendary free diver, and it was designed with extensive input from the man himself. Now, it's basically a 41.5 millimeter Seamaster Diver 300 meters, so the original James Bond style Seamaster. There is an aluminum insert within the bezel, which is 120 click and can be aligned easily with the stylized hour or minute hands. You you can also see, and we'll get a little bit closer here so you can see in better detail, there is a lovely vertical stainless steel like satin grain to this dial. And you can see that the disc underneath that registers the passing minutes or the time elapsed, it's alternately a grained pebble like or almost sandpaper like surfacing in silver and then matte red. You'll also note that back in an era when the dials of the standard diver 300 meters were printed, here we have applique indices. The hands are completely unique to the model. You have seven apertures and each one changes from red to silver and vice versa in one minute. So we have a seven minute display and with potentially 14 minutes elapsed in the course of two color changes, you can time even the longest free dives. Now, you can also see it has a slightly different bracelet than a standard diver 300 meter at the time. This is more like the bracelet you would have seen on the Speedmasters back then. You can also see that the watch includes a fold-out diving extension. This is the same clasp that we know and love on the Bond Seamasters from the time. It's not as big as it looks. It's based on an ETA 2892 automatic base, so it is a vertical clutch modular chronograph that beats away at 4 hertz and has a 44-hour power reserve. It is 300 meters water resistant, and it's not quite as big as, as it looks. On the wrist, you can see it's thick, but it's not excessively broad across the wrist, and it's probably one of the most fascinating fascinating and unusual Seamasters ever created. One of my absolute favorites, a very useful watch that has a completely original aesthetic shared with no other Seamaster or Speedmaster, a very special timepiece. And of course, on the case back, you can see a tribute to Jacques Mayol, who had a uh, fascination, particularly with cetaceans and dolphins in particular. So a very cool watch and very emotional for Omega and Omega collectors. Now, this one right here is a little bit more recent. This is a 2020 model year launch, a combination of titanium bezel insert, laser ablated, and a 42 millimeter stainless steel case with a matte and polished ceramic dial. It is the Seamaster Diver 300 meter Necton edition. Necton, a nonprofit ocean conservation outfit that partners with Omega, named its research submersible Seamaster 2, and you can see Seamaster 2 on the reverse side, but the Seamaster the watch Seamaster is the focus here. Technically speaking, it's identical to a standard diver 300 meter, but the look is unique. As you can see, you have that laser bladed frosted titanium insert within the bezel. Still have the helium escape valve, and while the dial is also ceramic, it's actually an invert of what you'll see on the standard diver 300 meter, which has a polished 
a set of raised waves and then recesses between the waves. Well, here, the recesses have in fact been raised, relieved, and polished, and the waves themselves are dropped and matte finished. There's a chapter ring outboard, and inside we have a 8800 series movement, so 55 hour power reserve, master chronometer, anti-magnetic silicon hairspring, and you'll also note that this watch is a no-date dial, so while you have a hacking seconds function, there is no quick set because this watch has no need of one. Quickly popping it open, and why not, right? Throw it on my wrist. It features a special strap that was designed just for the Diver 300 meter that folds nicely down and around the wrist. There's no fight or flare. The look is, well, the, the look is modern. It's not oversized, but it's also not undersized, nor is it too thick to fit underneath the cuff because it doesn't have a display case back. It's a little bit thinner than a standard Diver 300 meter, which makes this a wonderfully talented all-arounder. Let's do a loom check because this is a Diver. Okay, so here's the diver 300 meter right here, and you can see that the minute hand and the bezel pearl are green to make it easier to tell them apart from the rest of the dial. And right here is the Jacques Mayol, which I think I should show because it is also a diving watch of sorts. So there you go. Two generations of Omega Diver. You know what? I'm, I'm not done with my loom shots. I've got a better one. I've got a better one for you. Hang in there, guys. Can you guess? Do you already know? By the way, take a look here. You can see that the numerals are actually three-dimensional blocks of Luminova. They tower over the dial. This is not a printed dial. And this is not a common Moser. This was a, a 2019 launch, 42 millimeters in stainless steel, automatic winding with a three-day power reserve. It is the Moser Heritage Center Seconds Funky Blue. So you have the Moser vintage-inspired heritage case, and this watch is a thinly-veiled homage to the pilot's watches of the first third of the 20th century. You have Moser's traditional sculpted case flanks here with a shallow coining, a lovely oversized Moser-branded crown, wire-style lugs, a calfskin aviator strap with a contrasting stitch featuring a little bit of fotina, but fortunately Unfortunately, there is no Fotina on the dial. Now you have those solid applique blocks of Luminova for the numerals, a railroad track outboard for reading the seconds and minutes, loomed broadsword style hands, and that Moser funky blue color that fades from almost a cobalt metallic to nearly black navy blue at the edge. You do have hacking or stop seconds. Flip it upside down, caliber HMC200, bi-directional winding with a magic lever style, Paul based winding system. It is a 72 hour power reserve. Beats away at 21,600 vibrations per hour, and you can see that the hairspring, the balance, and the escapement are all of Moser's own construction via their precision engineering subsidiary tungsten rotor, double crested coat de Genève on the bridge with engine turning on the base plate. Note that it uses a full balance bridge with a free sprung index for shock tolerance. So while the look is vintage, the watch is actually quite hardy on the wrist. It's a sports watch, and though a 42 millimeter, it doesn't look like a 42 because of these spare wire style lugs. Think Panerai Rodimir, and at least in terms of ergonomics, you have the general idea. And as you can see, it is quite thin for an automatic winding extended power reserve sports style watch. Moser continues, and one might even argue ups the ante here. This was a late 2018 announcement for the 2019 model year, but is the Pioneer Tourbillon, and it does feature a signature fume fade in blue over a flying tourbillon. Once again, Moser, through precision engineering, its subsidiary, creating all the tough parts of this movement, the balance, the twin horizontally opposed hairsprings, the escapement, all of that. And let's get a little bit closer. You can see it's a flying tourbillon because there's no upper bridge to obscure your view of it. You see the two stud holders, both black polished, and by having two hairsprings, flat hairsprings, horizontally opposed 180 degrees apart, in one position, one of those hairsprings will cause the balance to slow down. The other will cause it to speed up. They cancel out. Change the position, and now the other one speeds up, and the other one slows down. They cancel out again. Reclaiming the original chronometric intent of the tourbillon, the horizontally opposed 180 degrees out-of-phase hairsprings make this not just an impressive feat of engineering from a visual standpoint, but also a real chronometer-style watch in the traditional intent of the tourbillon. Stainless steel, 120 meters water-resistant, fully loomed, automatic winding, and in spite of the power-intensive complication here, we still have a three-day power reserve. It's a bigger watch, 42.8 millimeters. You can see on my wrist, this is probably the smallest wrist that would wear this watch, maybe 15 centimeters circumference. Once again, my wrist is 16 centimeters circumference. Take a look down the barrel to get a better sense of the fit. Over the top, you can see it's right out 
out to the edge of my wrist. It's thick, but not comically so for a multi-complication. Now, if you turn the watch over, you can see there's a little bit more finery. Uh, by the way, also full deploying clasp, twin trigger actuated, and stainless steel, media blasted and polished. A nice accessory that is not universal on Moser watches, so it's nice to have that full deploying clasp. As I mentioned, Moser cases always feature some sort of scalloping in the flank. Here we have a deeper scalloping and then a coining, and Moser cases are first machined and then hand finished to create these three-dimensional shapes, forms, dips, nips, and tucks. Turn it all over and you can see that this is a little bit more elaborate a movement. The tourbillon pivots on ceramic bearings rather than a jeweled staff. And then you have a golden chiton fixed by black polished screws holding the mainspring barrel in place and that to reference the 19th century era and early 20th century era of Moser pocket watch construction. talk about two rather spectacular sports watches in titanium. This is a model that was launched last year, the Grubel 4C Balancier S, 18 pieces, limited edition, grade 5 titanium externally, 100 meters water resistant, manual wind, 3-day power reserve, loomed, and as you can see, it's exactly 45 millimeters across and just under 40 millimeters from bezel tip to bezel tip, which is the maximum distance across the wrist. Now, what you might not notice at first glance is that this watch also features a blued grade 5 titanium movement and a lovely a cambered case back that allows it to flow over the wrist where easily. You can see the edges of this case are nowhere near the edges of my wrist, so you might even be able to wear this on a wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference. It is not thin, but then again, you don't wear a Grubel 4C to make it disappear, and it is supremely comfortable. The finishing and engineering absolutely without compromise. I'm going to try to pop this strap off the buckle real quick so you can get a better look at this watch because the case back here is an event. 18 pieces. You can see it features a double deployant twin trigger clasp that features several different finishings, including media blasting and polish. Uh, the same is true of the case. You can see polished highlights, the super graphics that collectively, in French, describe Grubel 4C's philosophy of building watches. The company making between 100 and 120 watches a year out of Le Chaux de Fonds. They have about 100 to 120 employees to do that, and that one-to-one -one ratio of employees to watches made speaks to the level of finishing that's executed on these watches. Titanium here will be hand-finished and beautifully blued. The screws are the proverbial 100 Swiss franc screws. They feature chamfered slots, circumference, black polished tops, and polished pilots. You can see the barrel with its own graphics, and the timepiece of course, with an enormous free sprung balance adjusted in six positions. You'll note not only is it free sprung for toughness and precise adjustment, but it also features a handmade overcoil hairspring with recessed gold balance bolts. Now, the watch is a power reserve indicator on the dial side, and as you can see on the reverse side, the watch does include a dramatic set of blued bridges. Note that the pivot jewels are set in golden chiton a la pocket watch, and that we have no shortage of sharp interior angles where two bevels meet, plus these lovely polished ridges that rise up at the edge of the bridges, and the wheels themselves feature chamfering on their interiors, something that even many Geneva Hallmark movements do not include. A very special watch, and again, one that's not afraid to get wet, a rarity amongst the ultimate in haute de gamme sports timepieces. Remember, Jorn sports watches, for the most part, look aggressive, but you can't swim with them. Grubel Forcey gives you the full package. Now, here's one that... Uh, frankly, is a little overlooked. I often call the DB25 the point of entry into the Debitune brand for those who don't necessarily want an exotic-looking watch, but the DB27 gives you a nice middle ground between the uh, conventional forms and dials of the DB25 cases and, of course, faces, uh, and then the DB28's extravagant floating lug open dial, open movement type architecture. So here we have a conventional solid dial, but we have the floating lugs of the famed DB28 for variable geometry adjustment to your wrist size. Now, it's four 43 millimeters in grade 5 titanium, but only 12.2 millimeters thick, so make no mistake, this bullhead setter and winder is very much a wearable watch, slim and cuffable. Grade 5 titanium is super light and more scratch resistant than 316 steel, and you can see this model, which launched in 2012, is the first generation DB27 Titan Hawk. So it features the 6-day automatic winding power reserve rather than the post-2018 60-hour. The 2018 60-hour is a little bit more accessible financially. This one has more technological 
Technological Innovations and the Full Fat Six Day Power Reserve. It also features the center radial date indication on the dial, which you don't get on the second generation of the Titan Hawk. Now, the watch is 43 millimeters in diameter, but in fact, doesn't wear that large, so don't be afraid. There's a quick set for the date system, and then you can see that, like the DB25s, here we have a conventional solid dial. Debitune makes its own dials, its own cases, and its own movements, so this watch is all Debitune, a company that has made fewer than 3,000 timepieces since it launched in 2002, and it makes only about 150 watches a year, so remember, FP Journe is about 900 watches a year, and Richard Mille is about 5,000 a year to give scale. The dial does feature the micro light engraving, which is a signature of Debitune. They use that in lieu of Guilloche. Although it is reductively cut, it's also less hackneyed. It's their own innovation. Turn it all over, you can see a little bit of the caliber S233. Again, the second generation Titan Hawk features a 60-hour automatic. This is six day. You can see that the twin self-adjusting barrels, the shock protection system, the hairspring, the solid disc of silicon with a white gold rim that is the balance wheel, all of that is patented, and you can see that this was DB27, a uh, Series 8 and number 10 off the line. So these are low-volume watches and outstanding ones. Debitune, in my opinion, the best independent watch for the money at any price. talk about Rolex a bit. I know, you've had enough Rolex with watches and wonders, but we're going to turn back the clock first to 2015. Uh, what we've got here is an Oyster Perpetual 39, 39 millimeters, and it's got a lovely anthracite dial with cyan blue accents. And of course, this is the 114300. It's got a lovely domed bezel evocative of the original 1933 Oyster Perpetual, the so-called first of the bubble backs that pioneered the combination of the Oyster water-resistant case with the perpetual automatic winding system. Now, it's a lovely watch. It's a chronometer. It's 100 meters water-resistant. It's automatic winding. It's well-loomed. This is a watch you can wear full-time. Comfortable and relatively devoid of hype, the Oyster Perpetuals trade for honest value. That is, they trade for a value that actually accurately represents the engineering and the attention to detail that goes into their construction. The hype factor on these is not high, so if you want to get into Rolex without spending a mint or waiting a year, this is a great way to do it, with a watch that is the closest living descendant of that original Oyster Perpetual. Now, taking a quick look at a watch that launched last year, this is an evolution of 2012 Skydweller, but a distinctly sportier. You've got a rose gold case, 42 millimeters, ever rose, as Rolex says, because it will not fade or oxidize over time, so the shade of that rose will not dim. It also has what Rolex describes as a chocolate metallic dial, which is lovely and features rose gold hands and indices and a lot more loom than the earlier Sky Dwellers did. But the big innovation for last year was the arrival of Oyster Flex. It is actually a nickel titanium alloy underneath the rubber sheath. So this is properly speaking a bracelet with a rubber sheath. Now, big upgrade from the first Oyster Flex straps. Here we don't have the Easy Link system. To make it easier to make friends with a strap that, after all, can't be cut through because of the metal, there is a glide lock style folding and sliding adjustment system, just like what you'll find on a Submariner or Sea Dweller with two millimeters of incremental adjustment. Let's zoom out a little bit, take a quick look. The watch is very sporty. Highly loomed, three-day automatic winding, 100 meters water resistant. It's both a GMT with a 24-hour second time zone and a clever annual calendar system that needs to be adjusted only once a year during the jump from February to March, and it is bi-directionally settable. You use the bezel to put the watch in its various setting modes. So, for example, with the bezel justified all the way clockwise, I pull the crown out and nothing happens. I can wind it, but I don't need to because it's automatic. Then I turn one click counterclockwise, and now I can actually drive the date forward or backwards. See how there's that little index right next to the hour hands? There are these 12 apertures corresponding to 12 months. So for example, we have one, two, three, four months, and that's the fifth. So we are looking at April 5th. That's the date you're looking at. Note that I can drive that system forward or backwards because it is wheel-based right here. It is not going to crash if I adjust it backwards. Now, of course, turn it one more click, and now I can adjust that local hour hand, turn it one more click, and now I will be able to adjust the second time zone as well as the local time zone, and everything is now in sync. You'll also note one more thing. When you turn all the way counterclockwise, you activate hacking seconds. But if you want the ultimate in bourgeois Rolex decadence, if you want to be a, a true 
shall we say, aristocrat among aviators, then you want the original Rolex pilot watches. Well, it's not the original pilot watch. There were some suited to aviation prior to the late 1954 debut of the GMT Master, but this is the classic Rolex pilot watch. And as I mentioned, it is an aristocrat. This model launched for 2019. It is the 126719 BLRO, which is the Pepsi on an oyster bracelet, but with meteorite dial, and it's all white gold. This is a timepiece that is without a doubt, rarefied air, even for a high-flying aviator's timepiece from Rolex. 40 millimeters, fairly thin. It can tell you three time zones temporarily if you set the 24-hour hand to Greenwich Mean Time. Ceramic bezel insert. The bezel is white gold. The insert is ceramic. And then the wells with the indices and numerals, that's actually a light platinum fill. The dial is meteorite with the Vidman statin patterns, and it's made of iron. So you have these... Uh, sort of metallic grains that are stabilized, first oxidized and then stabilized to create the Vidman statin, and they will never further oxidize. It will always look like this crystalline metallic flake pattern, and no two will ever be exactly alike. It's also 100 meters water resistant, as a 70 hour power reserve. It's chronometer, anti-magnetic, and shock resistant. So while it is without a doubt uh, a timepiece that will be rare, rarely seen, and ultimately upper crust, in any company. This is a timepiece that is nevertheless able to get rough and wild. Swim with it, shower with it, live with it on your wrist. It's a Rolex, so it's tough enough to do it. But again, all in white gold with a meteorite dial, this is a timepiece that's comfortable amongst the ranks of Richard Mille and Patek. It's amazing what you can do in steel these days. You can do an ultra luxury dive watch or a high complication. Let's talk about this watch first, because of the two, I have to admit, this is a sentimental favorite. If you remember the Doctor Strange from the movie of the same name, he had a very similar model. This one launched in 2016. It's the same basic post-2013 Master Ultra Thin Perpetual Calendar, but this 2016 model features a steel case and a black dial. Now, it's 39 millimeters by 9.4 millimeters thick, automatic winding, 43-hour power reserve, caliber 868. Stop seconds, it features a perpetual calendar system designed by IWC's watchmaker, Kurt Klaus. Seen on many IWCs, the main difference is that IWC makes you adjust it through the crown, uh, and it's really geared quite high. So with the IWC, people often accidentally set the calendar forward. It cannot be set back. When they're trying to set the time. So JLC uses a pusher adjuster. Everything is programmed, so it's a perpetual calendar. It can deal with leap years, can deal with irregular length months. Uh, but what happens is you just push the trigger and everything indexes uh, the day, the date, the month, the moon phase, the year. So you just press it a couple of times to catch up to your current date and everything will move in synchronized fashion so you don't have an impossible combination of years, months, dates, days, and moon phase. Flip it all over and you can see it is possible to see and appreciate caliber uh, 868. It is a combination of machine finish and hand finish worthy of other companies that do this. For example, Zenith and Audemars Piguet. It's free sprung for stability. It features a unidirectional winding system with ceramic bearings, a four hertz beat rate. It does have hacking seconds. There is a free sprung balance architecture for toughness and precise adjustment. My favorite refinement is the use of true fired blue screws. So kiln oxidized blued screws here. And the watch includes a full deploying clasp and matching steel, something that you don't see universally anymore on JLC watches, even on complications as they try to cut back on costs. Uh, this is a watch that makes very few compromises and represents the best of what Chagere Le Coult has traditionally been. Now, if you want to talk about another steel sports watch, uh, this one for the diver or perhaps the armchair diver, the desk diver among us, 40.3 millimeters in stainless steel, 13.3 millimeters thick, and under 47 millimeters lug to lug. This reference 5008 Blancpain 50 Fathoms mil spec is a very special watch. Now, it is the 500 piece limited edition mil spec from 2017. So, this one has a date. Unlike the subsequent Hoding key, it does have that extra functionality. It does have a full sapphire capped bezel, and instead of the standard, 50 Fathoms applique indices. Here we have printed features designed to evoke the late 50s mil spec watches. You can also see that the watch uh, features a handsome and visible caliber 1150 on the reverse side, 100 hours of power reserve. You can see it uses a couple of innovations that have come about since this movement was first designed in the 80s, including a free sprung architecture for toughness, a six rather than the former five position adjustment, and an anti-magnetic silicon hairspring. You can also see that there is individual numbering for the series on the reverse side, and you can see the brightness of the beveling or the anglage on these bridges here. What you're getting, engine turning, screw blackening, anglage, 
Cote de Genève, it is all manually applied, or at the very least, manually finished, even if it's machine started here. So you're getting a lot with this watch. Now, it's still 300 meters water resistant, so this is still very much a dive watch. Throw it on the wrist, not to be confused with the Hoden key, which is brushed steel and features a no-date dial. This is a little bit more practical as a daily driver. You can see at 13.3 millimeters thick, it will fit underneath most cuffs. In fact, it's already ducking under my cuff right here. It is very well loomed, and in fact, I should do a loom shot. Now you can see, with that fully loomed bezel, it is a spectacular watch at night. And that's one of the great modern traditions for the 50 Fathoms. Day or night, they simply look opulent. Okay, it was always going to end with this watch, because this watch is a living legend. Originally launched in 2008 and built in only 16 pieces, this is the Debetun DB26 Perpetual Calendar, the first of the line to use the famed floating lugs. Now, this model is rose gold with titanium floating lugs. It was the first time ever that de Batoon used this patented and soon to be famous variable geometry case sizing. Now, while the watch is 44 0.4 millimeters in diameter. It is quite thin, and it doesn't wear as an enormous watch. De Batoon, once again, making cases, dials, and movements. You can see all of them are highly specialized. Here, using sapphire hands for the first time, so you can more easily see the indications of the calendar. There's a lot going on here, as we have an aperture-style uh, set of calendar readouts. You can see that we have a spherical moon phase. I'm going to try to show you that, but one half is blued steel, one half is white palladium. It has an adjustment interval of 122 years. You do have the perpetual system, a satin matte dial, and then outboard we have these lovely fired blue cabochon for the hours. They're actually fired blue titanium. And flip the watch over and you can see De Batoon's in-house caliber 2005, and there is a lot to love here. First, you can see that the shock protection system, the balance bridge, and the springs entirely hand-finished with the bridge itself black polished, and then the springs beveled to a mirrored shine on their edge and then satin finished on their top. Note the traditional Cote de Genève here, known as Cote de Batoon. You could see right here that they actually reverse the wheel that lays down the stripes, which is why their dark facet is facing outboard on each side. They actually split the bridges down the center and then they finish each one with a reversed wheel to create that outward-facing gradient. Twin barrels, self-adjusting. This watch, despite being a perpetual calendar, has a five-day power reserve. Now, you can see that the balance wheel is not a wheel. It is a yoke. It's made of titanium with bulbs of platinum, and that's patented. The hairspring's patented. The triple shock protection is patented. The twin self-adjusting barrels are patented. The floating lugs are patented. The perpetual calendar is patented. The fire bluing of titanium is patented. And you can see that it is a very traditionally finished watch in spite of its extravagant aesthetic with satinated barrels, wheels, and mirrored anglage on the of the springs, the balance, the shock protection springs, the balance bridge, and also the edge of the barrel bridge with black polished screws. This is an extraordinary way to get into an extraordinary brand. De Batoon timepiece is rare. De Batoon filing an enormous number of patents for basic scientific innovations that find their way into those 150 watches a year. That's how you know you're getting what you pay for here. They're not assembling parts, they're building all the parts. And more than just building all the parts, they are engineering all the parts. The best way to get into independent horology and my favorite brand bar none if you like what you see reach out to me tmasso at thewatchbox.com for purchase pricing and availability details